welcome to this episode of Keto Chat. I am your host, Carol Freeman. I am a certified nutritionist and creator of the Fast Track to Keto Success program. I'm really excited because I'm here recording this live, although you're not watching it live, but from Low Carb San Diego uh, conference here, the second annual one here in San Diego. And I'm here to do some success story interviews with a couple of the participants or attendees of the conference here. And some people have traveled from very far away. Some people are a little, come a little bit closer. So um, tell us who you are and how, how long did it take you to get here? <laughs> so I've been, uh, my name is Jaydeep and uh, I've been following this diet since last uh, two years and I've lost around 130 pounds on it. Wow. And, uh, uh, I live in India. Okay. I'm a vegetarian. Okay. Oh my gosh. Yes. I, I have lots of questions for you because there's a lot of people that are watching this that I'm sure. that think they can't do it because of everything they see online. And so uh, I can't wait to explore your story a little bit more. Absolutely. Uh, please share. Who are Hi, I'm Karen Parrott and I'm from Carlsbad, California. Originally I'm from Indiana, central Indiana, but I've lived out here for the last 20 years. So that makes me basically a native. Excellent. So you, it took you about 45 minutes to get here, you said, and it minutes? took you 24 hours. 24 hours. <laughs> Thank you for coming so far, and I'm just really excited for yeah. both of you to share your story. So, um, Jadeep, would you mind to share? So, like 100 and some pounds is amazing. Definitely. Yeah. So uh, it, it began, I think, around two years back on uh, you know, February 2015. I realized my weight was 142 kgs, mm -hmm. and my waist was uh, 52 inches. Okay. I had pre diabetes and I had hypertension. Do you have do you have do you have some pants that you I, saved I from have men? photographs and pants okay. that I saved. Okay. Definitely, absolutely. Can't remove them. <laughs> <laughs> so I realized uh, I had a few medical conditions and uh, had to deal with it. I couldn't stand for more than ten to fifteen minutes and you know, everything was going down the hill. Yeah. That's when I realized that, you know, going to a normal uh, you know, nutritionist or a dietitian who, who tells you to eat small meals every two hours <laughs> was not working after trying that. And I realized that, you know, maybe some other step needs to be taken. And I got in touch with Dr. Westman. Okay. And I consider him to be my father figure. Okay. And uh, he told me that, you know, forget everything you know about nutrition and, you know, everything is a lie. So if you try this, your life's going to be much easier much easy and you can lose uh, fat really fast yeah so I especially flew down to uh, his place uh, for a few hours to meet him okay. from India Wow and uh, I had to meet him and I think that time I already lost uh, around 25 30 kgs mm -hmm. so after going back there I was more confident and was uh, extremely sure of what needs to be done and what things needs to be avoided and with exercise and with a proper vegetarian ketogenic diet, I managed to lose 130 pounds of fat. That's amazing, yeah. amazing. I, I can't imagine how fantastic you must feel and proud of yourself. And Absolutely. Yeah, you've got your, your father here My with father, you as well. Yeah. I can imagine he's really proud of you too. Absolutely. So, um, so tell us about in the very beginning when you were transitioning, because I'm sure if you're like everybody else who's transitioned on this diet, you were hungry all the time and eating, a, you were eating a lot of meals frequently, right? <laughs> Yeah, I think I think the fact was I was always hungry, right? And uh, always tired, always hungry. Mm -hmm. You know, sleeping way too much. Yeah. Uh, not realizing what's going wrong. Obviously, I've tried uh, you know all those so-called diets, uh, you know, restricted calories, and then I used to eventually put down, you know, put put on more weight. Okay, so, right, yeah. right. So after trying, you know, after trying them, losing some fat and putting on again, so this wasn't really working, and was you know probably depression was coming in, and I realized that. Uh, science is the perfect way wherein one should focus on yeah. and uh, yeah, by doing that I realized initially I was too scared I was too scared to leave carbohydrates you know we are very used to having uh, grains yes even in India especially being a vegetarian if I don't have grains then I eat what you know we don't have right. grains and right. you know nor do we consume you know seafood and you know, a lot of things uh, eggs at home I do not consume it okay. now I'm a lacto ovo otherwise I started off being a vegetarian a pure vegetarian okay so, so not even eggs ve vegan is what you know I'm in this, from no, the Seattle vegan, area no. vegan is something which is not even dairy but yeah right. being a vegetarian so I can't dairy, dairy but no eggs and no fish or yeah. okay so uh, I, I was scared to you know leave all the grains but I eventually you know I did not leave everything from the first day okay I gradually left stuff 
and uh, the, the results were showing and because the results were showing I had no issues leaving okay. leaving the carbohydrate pit yeah and eventually actually even the diet and uh, along with that I paired my diet with a lot of resistance training okay and uh, weight training really helped me uh, you know get higher ketone levels or to lose uh, fat faster okay it really helped and uh, till date I believe that you know one should be on a low carbohydrate lifestyle <coughs> and uh, weight training if it's for fat loss yeah. and being a vegetarian is is I don't think it it is difficult or people say that you know options very very little option but actually not really you know it's if you can be a little innovative when it comes to cooking or it can be you know probably consuming stuff or understanding nutrition the problem is people don't know what nutrition is people don't know what are carbohydrates if you understand carbohydrates you know uh, even vegetarians would be very easy maybe not to go under 10 grams of net carbs maybe 20 okay. and uh, that's equally good so how did you go from I'm a vegetarian if I can't eat carbs what else can I eat like what what was that transition like in the beginning what did you begin to add and what did you begin to cut out so you know I I had a lot of lot of issues convincing myself so I visited dr. Westman he told me that uh, Jadeep, I really don't know what Indians eat. <laughs> <laughs> so, Dr. Westman told me, but you know what? There's a cart which has been made, and I was very inquisitive, and I was asking him a million questions, and he was, mm -hmm. he told me that, Jadeep, there's a cart which is already there, which wants to, which can take you from point A to point B, and you're the one who wants to understand stuff, and you want to make a Ferrari. Mm -hmm. And, you know, he told me that, just make a Ferrari and tell me how you made it. <laughs> there is no fixed rules here and there are no fixed definitions here and I've, I've read most of the books written uh, you know the low carbohydrate books written and I realized that you know after following it and I'm, I'm even practicing nutrition in, in Mumbai and I realized that I have I've, I've close to 100 510 clients on the ketogenic lifestyle in India and I realized that things which are written in the books are are written to make your life more easy but that's not the only way out you know I have cashews and I still show ketones of three. The days I'm not resistance training, my diet's slightly strict. If I am weight training, then I can have fruits and still show a ketone level of five. Mm -hmm. So I've realized that, you know, maybe those rules from me and you could be different. If you are yeah. insulin resistant, if your fasting insulin levels are very high and maybe you will not be in a position to generate uh, beta hydroxy ketogenic. That's really key because, the, you know, what a ketogenic diet actually is, is not a set diet for everybody. It's not. A, you know, by definition, a ketogenic diet is a way of eating that puts you into yeah. ketosis. And so that's a great example of how it's going to look different for each person. And, and it's, it's people like, you know, people go on Google and they see a lot of stuff like, you know, the, I, I see these days peanut butter and, you know, yogurt and, you know, 10,000 different recipes. Some of them even having sugar inside mm -hmm. being sold under the, you know, roof of ketogenic. And I, you know, I believe a ketogenic diet is a diet wherein the body is generating ketones. Mm -hmm. Now, actually, it doesn't make sense to go online and say that, yes, I'm following a ketogenic diet, and the person's eating almond flour cookies, you know, 10 a day, and having <laughs> peanut butter, you know, maybe without <laughs> bread. And eventually, you know, that's, you know, the plot, the plot is lost here. Right. You know, the person right. doesn't realize, maybe he's going to put on weight, maybe he's going to get something. Yeah. His omega-6 levels are very high, the consumption in food. Your, mm -hmm. your uh, omega-6, uh, your uh, polyunsaturated 6 levels. Yeah. And that's not the best thing to do for information. Yeah. So I realized it's going to be different. And uh, rather than following things blindly by people who've been posting recipes, you should try and do a little bit of research mm -hmm. and understand that, yeah, you know, it is very easy in spite of being a vegetarian. But at the same time, too many things which others have been consuming is something which you rather restrict, yeah. especially when it comes for my story, I had I had to lose, uh, you know, 65 kgs, and I was sure that eating dark chocolate wasn't the way. Like it wasn't going to do happen every day. Mm -hmm. But because people were saying, "Yo, dark chocolate's allowed," and this is allowed, I, I I kept myself away from these things, and it really made a difference. Yeah. Even two small pieces of dark chocolate was making a difference when it comes to my average mm -hmm. fat loss. Yeah, that. So this is what I see it as. Mm -hmm. This was my my understanding to it. Right, right. That's really great. I've got tons more questions. I want to bring Karen in though to oh, catch you up with your. Oh, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> 
That's music for a station yeah. break. No, we skip it. Yeah. Yeah. There we go. For a message hey. from our sponsors. Yeah. Hey. <laughs> Hi, everyone. Just to bring you up to, to speed, yes. can you share us, you know, uh, how did you find a ketogenic diet and, and what's been your, your progress and success so far? Well, I uh, started long ago when I was, when I was six years old, I was overweight. And, that, and so I had been yo-yo dieting on and off. It was easy for me to be very active as a child. I, I would jog, say, in high school and when I was a teenager and through college, and my weight would go up and down. But once I was 31 or 32, I had thyroid disease. I had Hashimoto's disease in 1997, so it's been 20 years this week that I got diagnosed. Uh, that was difficult, but I went and, and lost via a count, uh, points counting system. Okay. <laughs> Might guess which one that is. Everyone knows what that is. Right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> yes, I did that, and that worked. I lost 60 pounds, and then I had my daughter um, almost 17 years ago now. But what happened is as I aged, especially as I aged, I noticed that I couldn't, I didn't always get the hunger and full signals that my points counting program told me I should get. And that was very difficult. I felt like I was a failure. I could see people around me being successful. Yeah, they just counted these points or calories. And I could not really do that. I would try and then maybe two to 10 weeks later, I would just fail. It would just start to overeat again. Also, as I aged, um, I, you know, I went through a few life difficulties and uh, became a single parent and, uh, and co-parenting with, with my daughter's dad. And during that time, I ate to soothe a lot and I just said, oh, I don't care. I'm just gonna go live. I'm gonna eat whatever I want to. But that turned out not to be such a great idea <laughs> for me in the long run. And then when I, I tried, kept trying to count points because the, really that was the most popular program out there. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and there's some big celebrities that were doing it, so I had to look. Yes, <laughs> yes. I was kind of starting, right before I started to go keto or low carb, I had bought those little sprinkles to put on my food. Oh and my gosh, last, yeah. But I, I have some use family them. members that, that were doing that yeah. too, yeah. <laughs> I didn't use them. So I did use a, a commercial weight loss program that I wouldn't use now because I'm dairy free and it was just very costly, and I, I know other ways to, to get weight off. So I did that program for 40 weeks, I lost 70 pounds, and that was five and a half years ago. To this day, I'm keeping off 71 pounds. Wow. So on a 5'1 person, that's, I think, I was a, a diagnosed type two morbid obesity from my doctor. I was close to being a diabetic. I was pre-diabetic, but I never got diagnosed. I knew, because I work in a lab, I knew what what all the diagnosis criteria were, and we had a pathologist that would go around to each cube and say, "If you have if you have prediabetes, you have diabetes. Don't forget it." Mm -hmm. And that really that really helped <coughs> to me to make a change. And then my company, the lab testing company, requires that I get weight and measure since 2011. I've been baselined for my weight, my cholesterol, uh, and they've changed the metrics. We a bunch of us went to them and said, "Hey." listen, it's important Important. what kind of cholesterol, not just total cholesterol, but um, they look at HDL. And so I only have to meet three out of five metrics. I can't pass certain metrics on the total cholesterol, but I can on HDL for sure, and my ratio. So that made, that made me happy that we were able to champion the company and, and get something that was a little bit more meaningful metric. And um, that was great. So in Fast forward, when I went to segue off the commercial program, I wanted to save money. So I said, oh, Rob Wolf had just come on the paleo scene. And uh, there was a, a woman named uh, Barbara Berkeley, MD. She advocates for a lower carb diet, maybe not keto. But I took that ball and kind of ran with it. I took her rules from her 12 rules of weight maintenance and to keep the body that you've earned. <coughs> Because weight maintenance for me was, I had to do a lot of work. I, I worked more in weight maintenance than I did do, losing weight because the program was very strict. And I'm also, I have what I call my food template where I eat from that. And I went lo more low carb and lo more low carb. And that worked up to a point that at a certain point I needed to eat, it didn't matter how many calories, calories in and out matter for me, but what matters more is that I keep my carbs a little lower and that I also intermittent fast. About a year ago, I got enrolled in a, um, a 
circadian rhythm for sleeping study mm -hmm. for, from Dr. Panda from the Salk, Salk Institute right here in La Jolla, very, very nearby. Mm -hmm. And um, for 14 weeks, I, I baseline for, uh, for two weeks, and then for 12 weeks, I tightened up my feeding window. And so I intermittent fast now with the same foods I was eating, even probably more, but I eat them in the morning. And then I start fasting around noon or one o'clock. And then I wake up the next morning and eat again. And I just water fast. Is so what, what changes did you notice with the intermittent fasting? Well, I had to, I had unintentionally put on about eight to 10 pounds. And it was all subcutaneous fat. It was just kind of hanging around here, right here. And it was more of, uh, you know, my blood sugars were pretty good. Uh, so that was good, but it, after being obese for so many years, 40 years, from age six to 46, and I had just gone through menopause as well, uh, it was just annoying. And it's like, I've worked really hard, I'm doing all the right things, what's wrong? So by uh, unknowing it last year at the, at the time, it, it did help me sleep, but as I got the intermittent fasting window tighter, I also got more into ketosis. And so that way I can have some, some vegetables. Um, I, don't, I don't do pork. I just don't react well to pork. And so I don't do bacon, so that's kind of tough. Oh. But I do meat, some seafood. Um, there's definitely some off-template foods that I don't eat because it will cause me to start binge eating. And um, I, I am also a cholesterol hyper-responder. I'm an APOE 3-3. Uh, Dave Feldman's going to talk more about this at the conference. It's hyper responders for APOE 44, but I'm 33, and I uh, so I switched to a little bit more lower saturated fat, uh, more sardines, uh, more avocados, uh, but I still eat a lot of beef. So <laughs> <laughs> I think he'll be uh, speaking later. Is it, I think it's today. I think it's room. tonight. Yeah. Yep. Yep. So uh, I hope to learn more from those experiments, especially because I still do need to pass my insurance discount. It's about forty dollars a month. Uh, I'm a single single head of household. I really need all that money so I can go travel and enjoy life after that. So um, so I did lose about uh, one or two pounds with intermittent fasting a month, just to give you an idea. So it took about it took about eight or nine months to get the weight off. And then to maintain my weight, I eat within my food template. Nuts are a big binge trigger, so I don't eat I I don't eat any nuts at all. I, I tried eating a few macadamia nuts, and I had binge, binge urges for two to three <coughs> days. Weeks, so okay. weeks. So yeah. it's not a, um, it's not a, a, a small decision to eat my own triggers. Also, xanthan and guar gum seem to be a very big binge trigger for me. So okay. uh, it's a little strange, but um, of course, sugar. I can have a little bit of eighty-five percent chocolate, uh, but I have to be careful with that, and I don't make it a rule. Uh, you know, I know what I can have and what I can't have. I uh, can I went to travel to Hawaii last year for my 50th birthday. I did not eat a bite of pineapple because I know that, that I would feel cruddy. And I were, I did all this work and I wanted to kayak with my daughter. I have pictures on my, I have a non-commercial blog about weight maintenance. I have pictures of, of paddling that kayak and I'm just so happy I could do ocean kayaking with my daughter and, and spend my time and money that way rather than with big health care bills. Yeah, well, so. that's fantastic. And so, what did you notice difference? Because you you talked about before when you tried the points counting system yes. and how you just felt hungry all the time. Yes, that's a good um, point. One of the things is is I feel like the foods that I eat now for keto, the, the kind of the meat and the veg, occasionally berries in the summer if I'm really active, uh, just a very small amount. Um, I noticed that I have way better hungry full signals. I mean, just night and day difference. Now that doesn't mean a hundred percent of the time. Uh, it works well, and so that's why I do keep track on my Fitness Pal. I have, I'm sorry, <laughs> I have a Fitbit. I have a Fitbit, uh, and I connect that up to my Fitness Pal, and I take a look at my movement because if I start to feel like I want to eat everything out there all the time, because I can't <laughs> remember that what it was like, uh, then I know something. And sometimes stress can trigger it. Maybe not enough sleep and stress. Uh, I'm going to a financial planner to afford college for my daughter. Uh, I had to write down all my finances. I, will, I thought I could go eat everything in my little snack cabinet right now. And I think my daughter has some nuts right here and I think this and that and I'm like, nope, I'm stressed. That's the wrong signal. Yeah. It's my brain. I also, um, so I noticed that. I noticed uh, hungry full signals are much better. Mm -hmm. 
and uh, I, I really, for weight and maintenance, that is very, very helpful. I, I can, I, I, if anyone knows flying, uh, instrument rated flying, you have to rely on your dials uh, rather than looking out if you're going through a cloud bank or fog or tough weather conditions. If it's, if it's so, I like to think of it as instrument based keto weight yeah. maintenance. So, well, that's one of the things that I've noticed working with all my clients is that you know I was trained as a nutritionist that. Um, you know, restrictive diets are what cause eating disorders and it just causes people to be more miserable. And so mm -hmm. when you went after, it sounds like after your divorce where you went through that, like, well, I'll just eat all foods. I'm gonna be happy eat and it. love myself the yeah. way that I am. That's the way that I was trained. Mm -hmm. And everybody here probably can attest it, but all that is is a recipe for weight gain and weight problems. Absolutely. And uh, what I found is that it's actually really freeing to not have that constant hunger and you actually get, you get control over your eating. You can notice those subtle signals and make a choice rather than uh, before being in that fat storage mode where you're just compulsively eating and, and reactively eating because your body is starved for energy. So uh, thank you for sharing mm -hmm. how what a difference that is for you and mm -hmm. and now you actually have the, the choices instead yes. of compulsion. So yes. um, I'm going to go back to you then and talk about um, what was it like, um, you know, did you struggle at all with like former high carb foods, right? So a lot of people think of like, well, what about like this or that or bread or, you know, don't you miss that? Or can, can, you're never gonna have, I mean, for you, was it chapati rice? Was it naan? What was your traditional chapati, and chapati rice. right? So what, you're never gonna have that again? Like, you know, I, I missed being fit. <laughs> and I missed being fit more mm. than I would miss that bread. Right. Mm. So a lot of people come and ask me, that how did you do it or you know you have a lot of determination yeah. uh, you pulled it off and you struggled a lot and it must be a difficult journey and you know sometimes I say yeah but actually that's not that's not true and I personally feel that my journey wasn't difficult mm -hmm. you know they probably imagined that I was under a lot of stress mm -hmm. and I was doing things which was things which were difficult but actually I was, I was not hungry. Mm -hmm. I was doing or eating things which I loved. Mm -hmm. I was getting results. Mm -hmm. And I was, there was no pity here. There was no, there was no bad side here. Mm -hmm. yeah. So where was the difficult part? There was no difficult part. So for them, they thought that the difficult part was not to have that bowl of rice exactly. or probably that size slice of bread with jam on it. And uh, I think it all boils down to how badly you want to be fit. And uh, if a person who has diabetes or if a person who's fat and, you know, I had, I couldn't tie my own shoelaces mm -hmm. and I wanted to tie them. That was more important yeah. for me. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And a lot of people, you know, for them, even in spite of having diabetes and, you know, HbA1c is being seven. And if they say, or they, you know, have this thought process of when should I cheat? It means that for them, getting rid of diabetes was, wasn't a very important thing. For them, eating that slice of bread was still there. Mm -hmm. So I personally feel it all boils down to how badly you want it. Mm -hmm. And yeah. once you know that, you know, I think the path's already made. For me, I kept education on, I studied nutrition. Mm -hmm. So I was knowing that if I study nutrition, it would be very easy for me, you know, by not getting in the false knowledge which has been there. And I realized by studying nutrition for myself, eventually I got a chance to help 500 more people, yeah. you know, to lose weight. And uh, right. yeah, it was a great journey. Yeah. And uh, I don't miss my food. I'm enjoying <laughs> it in spite of being a vegetarian. There are a lot of options and uh, it's not difficult at all. It's a lifestyle change. Well, and how different was it getting on the airplane to come here the, for this <laughs> event versus when you went you, to first you see got Dr. the right Westman. question, yeah. 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 So yes, uh, I had to tell uh, the airline guys to uh, make or to, to give me a lacto o, you know, dish, mm -hmm. something with eggs. Although I didn't get it, I was carrying nuts. Mm -hmm. But these nuts mm -hmm. are not the best thing for me. <laughs> it's because I always start off thinking I'll have 10, mm -hmm. and it, it ends up being 100. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> so, but I still feel that, you know, I would rather, rather do that mm -hmm then to have that bun and bread which has been served yeah. you know on the flight 
Well, and then how about fitting in the seat on the airplane? What, what's oh. the whole experience of uh, flying on the plane like? So, so you know, uh, when I was 142 kgs, my waist was 52 inches, and you know, I obviously, uh, uh, I think very few would, people can relate to me, you know, being so fat, wherein you can't even sleep straight, and your sleep apnea is always, and you wake up tired, and you need to sleep again. So, I think small, small things like sitting in a, a, a you know, a seat where you do not need extension belts, where you can tie your own shoes and when you can wake up fresh and where you can fit, you know, on, you know, in jeans, which probably, you know, like your friends do the same size yeah. and you don't need to go and get them stitched. I think all these things, small, small things, yeah. they really matter. And now that I look back, you know, okay, I feel, yes, that's a beautiful journey of, you know, having, being in a position to go to a shopping mall and buying your own clothes and then testing your blood and seeing an SPA1C of five. Mm -hmm. I think that's a wonderful experience. Yeah. And uh, yeah, like so I was very anti-social. I remember when I was at my peak, you know, I was not in attending social events and was not willing to go out, meet people, social functions. Uh, you know, traveling was always difficult. Watching a movie in a cinema hall was always difficult. But uh, I think I'm enjoying doing things which I couldn't do. And uh, I enjoy shopping and I enjoy traveling now. Yeah. And I enjoy watching myself on interviews. <laughs> <laughs> Soon. <laughs> yeah. so do you, now, a lot of people um, that have lost a lot of weight like you have, they report that their mind still plays tricks on them and sometimes they wake up and feel like, did I really lose the weight? Am I, you know, my back at that weight? And do you ever have to kind of check that? I or? have a lot of clients who dream about food mm -hmm. and then they wake up mm -hmm. thinking that they ate it mm -hmm. and that yeah. troubles them yeah. a lot. And actually, you know, I used to, for, for a normal person, I don't think it's very difficult for, you know, some people to believe or assume, oh, why would a person dream about eating a pizza and then wake up? But actually, it used to happen to me. Mm -hmm. You know, there are times that I used to wake up with, with sweat on my face thinking that I ate something and I was convinced that I've eaten it. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, I think, you know, I think that's not the right thing. And now I've realized that, you know, to be afraid of food, there are people, I have clients who fight, who fought with their family, mm -hmm. even if the food was made in the same vessel, mm -hmm. which was used to cook for the other, other family members which had carbohydrates. And they used to fight. And they used to say, oh, you know, maybe it has some sugar inside. And uh, you don't need to be that, that, that anal about things. You, you can be a little flexible. Now, actually, in fact, I tell my clients these days, especially the vegetarian ones, that till the time you're, you know, you're, till your 80% of your goal's been achieved, try to be focused. Mm -hmm. When you're starting on this new lifestyle, do not try to make travel plans because they don't have correct information. They may end up cheating. So initially for the first two to three weeks, the person should educate on how, what to eat and how to eat. Post that, you know, even after achieving 70 to 80 percent of the goal, even if the person feels like cheating, but if he is confident that, that you know, I can get back, then it's okay to cheat because we all are human beings. So, you know, now one side of the story is that, no, this is a lifestyle, you should not cheat. But we all have birthdays and we all have those events where we want to have that sugar. Maybe you want to drink that wine. And occasionally, I, I don't see there's any rule, you know, you cannot break this rule. I personally do and I'm fine. You know, I will never say that, no, this is my lifestyle and be, be on it forever. But for most of the times, I would follow this lifestyle. But maybe having achieved 80% of my goal, I wouldn't mind occasionally going out and having a cup of rice occasionally. There's no rule here that once a week cheat is allowed, yeah. but whenever I want to. But I think what you pointed out was that that's not happening in the beginning. You're Definitely staying, you not. have to stay really consistent. So if it starts yeah. happening in the first one week, then you, yeah. you yeah. can't get results. Sure. <laughs> yeah. So I'm going to ask you each, each the question that I hate the most, oh. only because I know that Maybe not you guys are wondering, but I know people watching are wondering is what do you eat? What is a typical day? I hate this question, but 
Um, people are gonna, especially for a vegetarian, I'm gonna pick, pick on him a little bit. That's great. Um, That's people great. wanna know, like, what's a typical, what do you eat? If you can't eat bacon and steak and burgers, what's left? Okay, this is a very difficult question for me, in fact. Uh, but it all boils down to having, you know, a group of uh, 20 vegetables I have. Okay. Made, a meal list, personally, my favorites, where it's, you know, revolve around those vegetables. Along with that, uh, cottage cheese is almost same as meats when it comes to carbohydrates. We mm. call it we call it paneer. Okay. Mm. Yeah. And it's not as heavy as cheese. So probably you may not want to have 200 grams of cheese a day, but cottage cheese is something which yes, 200 grams of cottage cheese consumption can can easily happen, and you won't feel that heavy after eating it. And it's already a part of the Indian eating mm -hmm. habit to consume cottage cheese. Yeah. Basically, uh, not only is it very low in carbohydrates, it's, it's very good as a protein source because we're not getting meats, but bioavailability of protein is is as good as the non-veg part, which is cottage cheese. Yeah. And uh, apart from that, so that is around two two meals of cottage cheese. Like, how would you, if a normal non-vegetarian would consume probably two to three meals of meats mm -hmm. with vegetables. Now, I've just replaced those meats with cottage cheese. Okay. And the extra two meals, if at all I am hungry, it would be two meals of eggs, or one meal of egg, and one dry snacking meal, could be flaxseed crackers, could be spinach crackers, you know, olives, avocado, cheese, half a scoop or maybe a scoop of zero carbohydrate whey protein, mm -hmm. if I am weight training. Yes, zero carbohydrate weight proteins also tend to influence uh, my, uh, my ketone levels. But now I do not check my ketone levels at all because I don't see there's a, I don't see any reason to check because I'm, even if I check I'm always around one one point five and I'm happy with it and there are days that I really want to decrease more fat become want to become more leaner mm -hmm. then I try to get back to around three two point five to three that's it almond milk is is something which I love I relish the unsweetened unsugared almond milk cold coffee is something which I like having. I do not do a lot of cream, the full fat cream, is because I've realized that uh, too much of fat consumption also restricts my uh, fat loss and it kind of gets my ketone levels back to down, back to uh, zero ish. Okay. But uh, at the same time, you know, to say 50 grams of cream, it may sound nice, but 50 grams of cream is just two tablespoons. So it's, it doesn't help me. Like 50 grams of tablespoon is like, it doesn't help me. Two tablespoons is not enough. The cup it, it's is not too enough much. for me. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So there are a lot of people who feel that uh, you know this much cream would be enough, or these many almonds would be enough. But right. th these are all, as she said, trigger uh, foods for me. Mm -hmm. I cannot stick to five almonds or ten almonds. I cannot stick to two tablespoons of cream-based desserts. I need to have more. Yeah. So then I would rather not have it. Yeah, paying attention to what foods make you hungrier and cause you for you two weeks of misery, mm -hmm. it's easier just to avoid those than to sort of play that Russian roulette with those. So, so how about for you? You've already explained how you um, you know eat a, a small window in the morning. What's mm -hmm. what's typically on the table for you? So usually most mornings I get up in the morning. I'll make three eggs. Uh, I did switch out. I used to use coconut oil and I'm switching to a little bit more olive oil and I know I shouldn't heat that so I use use a very small amount over really light heat. I also saute up some kale with a tiny, I'll drizzle on a tiny little bit of olive oil near the end and just take a, a little salt in both and uh, stir those up. They all get done at about the same time. Uh, if I'm hungry, I may add an ounce or two of protein to it from my freezer. I can just heat that up in the morning. Uh, or I can just uh, take a couple bites of an avocado. Here in Southern California, avocados are, are inexpensive and they're almost year round here. And I buy the little holy guacamoles too. So if I'm just at the avocados, you go to the store, they're rock hard and you really can't peel them or eat them. So I'll have those sitting around in the refrigerator, the freezer, so I could have some avocado or guacamole if I want. And then I might take a spoonful of the uh, fermented vegetables. I really like the farmhouse culture, uh, jalapeno, a little spicy. So I have a spoonful of that in the morning. I'll go to work, take a nice walk, and use that for my lunch walk with a coworker. 
and then I'll have my big bigger meal of the day. I might have a grass-fed burger from uh, Trader Joe's, or I might have a couple of chicken drumsticks with a little bit of romaine lettuce and one one vegetable maybe added in, maybe not. It just depends. And depending on the chicken, on how dry it is, if it's chicken breast, like off a rotisserie chicken, and there's not much uh, skin there, I'll add a little olive oil. I keep olive oil, balsamic, garlic salt, and onion salt in the cabinet at work, and everyone shares, and they, they really love that. Uh, so I've been told, <laughs> the levels keep going down, uh, <laughs> but I'm happy to share my, my loot with everyone. Uh, I'll have a little 85% chocolate, some coffee. I have coffee in the morning also. And then right around, right around noon, I go ahead and I uh, have my last meal of the day. It might be a homemade soup with some turmeric in there, some broth from Costco, and then if either beef or chicken, or I'll have some sardines. I'll have half a can, tin of sardines, and that's a nice cheap protein. Uh, I like my sardines room temp, so if I have the other half, I have to remember to get them out and kind of let them warm up a little bit. Uh, so I do do those. I might have a vegetable there. I can do some root vegetables in small amounts, like onions and carrots, and I test that with my blood glucose meter to make sure I'm not spiking, and like friend Ziska will say later on during her talk, the when you spike, if you stay, stay spiked and stay up, and like if I have potatoes in a stew, eating out, and I even I pick out the potatoes. If I come home and test my blood sugar, when I used to eat at night, uh, I look diabetic like all night long, and I know that's not gonna be good for my eyes, my liver, my kidneys, but my whole body, it's just not going to, you know, it's just not the right food for me, although I know a lot of people can. So I did spend a lot of time poking my finger for glucose. I don't monitor my ketones, um, blood. I think about it all the time, but I'm a medical technologist by trade, and so I know I want to test way too much, and the strips are really expensive. So I'm going to hold tight here. I know some inexpensive ways of testing are coming out, and ketonics. We've got one, we've got one here. Now and the, the keto, mojo, keto mojo that's yeah. coming out. Yeah, so I'll be looking into those things as time goes on so I can get some more affordable testing. I do, <coughs> once I get my food template all straightened around, I'm eating sort of the same foods in the same season. I usually typically won't test my glucose even because I know how I'm going to react. Um, although um, I do, if I make a change to my food template, when I went from weight loss to weight maintenance earlier this year because I lost about eight pounds after I, I did the IF, uh, 17.7 is what I usually do, uh, 17, starting from 6 a.m. to 1 p.m. So I did some testing around there to make sure I wasn't going to make things worse with my blood glucose and everything held steady. But what I do do is if I added in um, pumpkin seeds and more avocado, a little bit more olive oil for my extra calories to maintain because I, I was losing and I needed to stop losing because I'm at you know, a certain BMI, certain weight, and I'm short, so I need to just stop. So um, if I need to, to, if I feel like the scale's going up again, which sometimes it does, I'll back out the pumpkin seeds a little bit. And I always, I measure it out, and just like you know, I am in the lab, in grams, and I go, okay, this is my little container for the day. I never eat straight out of the bag because I will, not, I will not stop. It will not happen. So, um, but I can, uh, so I may or may not on some of the salads or for, for um, that last meal, I might have some pumpkin seeds. Um, uh, after that, I'll have water. I don't have coffee because on the original study, um, it was an IRB approved study, it was, no, it was water only. So I got used to that. I know Dr. Panda uh, from in La Jolla, he says that drinking decaf or coffee or anything other than say, like sparkling water or water, that can change your hunger, your hunger hormones or your, your hormone signaling. So I decided I would go ahead and uh, just stick with water. I make a few exceptions. I donated blood last week. I needed to eat in the evening. I felt like I needed to eat. Uh, if I have a 12 hour day at work and I'm on my feet and I'm running around, running around, running around, especially in the heat, I come home and I can feel it. I'm almost shaking or there's just something is off. I don't know if any of you have ever fasted, but you kind of get that signal that you need to do something right now or I'm gonna be passed out. I have not ever passed out, but um, I will have something. I, in the evening, not eating protein seems to help me eat all my protein, especially my carbs. I can eat a little bit more carbs if I have them really early on. So 
so I can, I, this morning I had a small handful of blueberries, but I did weigh them out with my little scale, exactly how many ounces or grams. And I'm a data-driven person, so that's just me, and I, I lean into that. So I know not everybody is, but I, I really use it to my advantage. Yeah. Well, thank you for sh sharing all the details. And um, I want to open it up now. We actually have a live studio audience here, so I want to open it up to any questions that people have for, um, yes. Let me, I'll, I'll restate the question because it's probably not coming up on video. So, um, great question. So, as you lost a tremendous amount of weight, how did you deal with extra loose skin? Yeah. I do have a lot of loose skin and I do need to get operated. The surgery would be an abdominoplasty. You know, now it's just genetics. Some people very rarely do not require the surgery. Some people do, but you know, there are, there are people believe wrongly. Like people say that if you would have lost weight slowly and gradually, you wouldn't have, you know, needed that surgery. And that's all, that's a lie, it's because if you've stretched your skin like beyond mine was beyond 50 inches for so many years, and if you are deflating this balloon again, it it cannot be back to the original size of the balloon. The same way, your skin's never going to be back so firm and then there's an exception here uh, it's pregnancy mm. wherein you know in spite of getting back but it's only there for a few months the high the, the largest circumference the max circumference is only there for a few months like that would be two to well, two it to depends three months. on depends on the mother yeah <laughs> <laughs> so so but you know having kept a waist of uh, 52 inches for so many years and I, I don't think that anyone, not only me, anyone, if, if you get back to a waist of 32 inches, where did the 50, 20 inches go? It can't mm -hmm. come back, it has to be loose. And so yeah, I do need uh, some correction in my stomach. But that doesn't mean that, you know, I, I still have some body fat to lose, but the moment I lose that, you know, wearing a t-shirt or shirt, you know, the six pack, so-called six pack, what people dream of can be beautifully seen. <laughs> it's just the skin that needs to be come up, removed, basically. The muscles are already there, and the skin's gonna be showing the, if you don't have any extra fat on it. So, yeah. So, so some people get that, the question of like, oh, like they, they imply that somehow losing the weight and having that extra skin isn't worth it. And that, that you should yeah, just stay yeah, the way you are. Like a, that they, they that deters statement. them. I've, I've, had a, I've had two, three people who've uh, asked me before, before joining or starting the diet. Yeah. And uh, they had 70 odd kgs to lose, maybe more than me. And the moment I told them that yes, you'll have loose skin, and they smiled, is because they didn't want to do it. They didn't want to lose weight because they thought, oh, loose skin is, you, if I'm gonna get loose skin, and I might as well not do it. <laughs> so then the question is that, you know what, they were more concerned about loose skin, they're not concerned about their HP1C, they're yeah, not concerned about, you know, their triglycerides. So anyway, that's something which a person is trying to make their life easy yeah. by, you know, giving such excuses. Yeah. How about you for loose skin? For me, yes, I had a lo I lost uh, 70 pounds in about 40 weeks. I refer to it as a birth in reverse. But <laughs> <laughs> as that first year, year and a half, uh, I found maintenance to be pretty easy from a nutritional standpoint, but I did have a lot more loose skin. Now, as I got lower carb to maintain my weight, I do feel like especially right here in the in the center, uh, my loose skin got a little better. So I do feel like that maybe being low carb or keto may have helped that. Now, I on my arms, like you said, you can see muscles, but underneath there's a lot of loose skin. And I'm left-handed, but I play sports with yeah. my right hand. So, and I, I lift, and when I was at the gym, I was wearing a, a sleeve of shirt at the gym over the weekend, and when I was lifting, I could see my muscles. But I also have, for whatever reason, about double the loose skin underneath here. So about half of my arm and half of my legs are uh, loose skin. And when I sit down, I'm kind of the same spread out as I was when I was 70 pounds overweight. So that was a little disappointing. I didn't look like Cindy Crawford, like, you know, I'm from the 80s. I didn't look skinny, skinny, but, it, but if I look at my pictures and I compare my before and after pictures, 
I mean, it's just, it's way different. It's a way different thing. Also, the great thing for uh, most people in, in most places is I can get kind of compression clothing for the gym, uh, for clothing I wear every day to work, and that really, for me, keeps it in check. Uh, I am a medical technologist, and so I do worry about infections. I have had some skin infections, and I know that that would, because I was morbidly obese, it may qualify me for surgery, but it's, it still would be highly risky and a lot of money. I want to save my money to go vacation with my daughter <laughs> and go see her after she goes to college and things like that and get her to college. So I just, uh, eating low carb and keto does seem to really impact my skin. When I first, the first couple of years before I was really transferring over to super low carb is I had a lot more skin infections and those have kind of gone away. Mm. Now, whether or not that helped with the skin being up, but uh, definitely in, in my abdominal area, my belly button, my C-section scar, um, I'm gonna get some skin infections in there. So I just keep a jump on it if I see it happening. I use some over-the-counter medications. So far, knock on wood, I haven't had to use uh, any other uh, more uh, stronger medication. Uh, but I will say, and I have gotten used to one arm looking different than the other, and uh, just like Padma on Top Chef, she talked about her scar. She had a scar from when she was little from a car accident, and it's very, and she doesn't hide it. And so I kind of take it, and when I see, when I walk by the bathroom, I look in the mirror, and I can see there, there's, you know, there's, I'll just show you guys. I don't care. I know it's going to be on YouTube. I don't care. <laughs> but, uh, uh, you know, half of my arm here, and then when I, down here now weight training can help some of that and this arm doesn't really have it really so much I mean yet yeah, loose yes but wrinkly no but you know what it that's you know I used to work in the Jocelyn diabetes clinic uh, in the Midwest and, you know we served them and I would go see people with amputations and, and just really tough lives so it's like I can mentally I can deal with this I can go talk to a counselor about it uh, the, the one place I really notice it uh, is when um, I swim, so when I went snorkeling, I went kayaking and paddled out there on my own, you know, and then hopped in and did the snorkeling, and in the water, I can really feel my loose skin, but it's just a, you know, I'm not snorkeling and kayaking all the time, but, but uh, when I swim in the water, I, and it's like, oh, this is just a memory of how I was, for, you know, the last 40 years, but now, now I'm, I, I can go do these things, and I have full mobility, so I'm really, I'm very lucky. And so I think as long as I keep my skin infections under control, then I'm fine. Well, it sounds like you look at it as a badge of honor, like this I, is a measure of success. I, I earned it, and I see people, I see yeah. people, because uh, I work, you know, where it's hot, uh, it can be 100 degrees or more at my job, <coughs> and I have to wear sometimes fancy clothes, but I'll take off my jacket, and then, you know, if my, my sleeve is shorter, yep, everything's all hanging out. And I see people looking over here, and I'm just like, yeah, yeah. Sometimes they'll ask me about it or recognize that I'm a, a, a big loser. Or, <laughs> or they'll, they'll see, they'll maybe see, catch a, a glimpse of a side where I, they can see some extra skin or something. They'll just notice something, and they'll ask me if I've had weight loss surgery. Mm -hmm. And so we talk about fast versus slow weight loss. But I don't think that that's true. I think I think it doesn't matter how fast or slow you lose it. I think you know you have it and you deal with it. Uh, and some younger friends do get surgery afterwards if they've lost a lot because it's going to really impact their life for, and they can't really hide it well in clothes. So and and it's usually not one surgery. It's usually two, three, or four. So. Yeah. Thanks. Other questions? Yes. How did you change years of habit uh, you're constantly eating, snacking, things like that? Yeah. Obviously, both of you shared the same thing of having a lot of excess weight and stuff like that. That was kind of an inspiration when you looked in the mirror. But what type of inspiration would you give somebody you know, like myself that has no weight problems but deals with essentially heart problems and diabetes mm -hmm. and at 50 years old loves a snack? Ah, so, you know, so what, what inspiration yes. can you give to, yeah, sure. to, to yeah. stop that snacking during the day that you can get on the right track? Great, great question. So I'll just uh, say it again so we can hear it here. So, um, you know, if you don't have a lot of weight to lose, but you have some other health things that are really important for you to be able to change um, your dietary habits, follow a ketogenic diet, how do you break the habit of constantly snacking all the time? 
I personally feel that there are two problems here. Uh, one problem can be external. That if a person's fat, that's an external problem, can be seen. Mm -hmm. And when a person externally is perfect, but internally maybe a pre-diabetic or maybe diabetes or maybe your triglycerides are very high, that's an internal problem. So I think the group of people who have external problems and internal problems, they have one thing in common, that have, they have a problem. And if the external problem is enough to keep a person motivated, you should find your reason. I think your reason would be to see your HbA1c perfect, or to see your triglycerides, or to see if you can go out and walk or run or weight train, and if you can see an increased performance in the first one week, if you see that your body is behaving differently in the first one week, then I think you will not need any motivation. Because people usually do not have this first one week. The moment you try for the first one week, and people are afraid is because they feel that, oh, their goals are too you know, big, and they have to start somewhere, and it's gonna be months or years of practicing. And that's not true, it just takes a week to really really know how, how different your body will feel. So one week of eating, and at the same time, even if you're eating crap, I personally feel it's not your fault. It's so many years of eating crap that your hunger hormones are misfiring. They're not, they're not behaving correctly and you know, that's fine. You need to accept it. Even after starting, if you end up cheating on the second day, you don't need to abuse yourself or you don't, you don't need to say that it's not meant for me, you know, or you don't need to say that, you know, I'm a loser. Try again. You know, people see the good side of my story. They don't see the, the negative, negative side that, yeah, that I have failed too during my attempts of losing fat. There were times that I've emotionally, I was emotionally stressed and eating wrong stuff. And maybe I've, I've eaten 10 scoops of rice creams and not one. That's something which I don't say. But yeah, it's okay to make mistakes and it's okay to cheat and it's okay to be all humans. It's okay to you know be hungry and eat crap. But as long as you realize that you have a problem, your second statement should, should be, I will solve it. And I come from the quality assurance side of the laboratory medicine field. And so I kind of stole from the corrective and preventive action template. And I, I told myself I would kind of get to the root of what, well, what is this feeling? And, oh, I'm angry. I'm really angry. Or I'm really uh, stressed out uh, about the, the finances. Um, so, okay, there's that feeling, I'm gonna feel it, but I'm gonna go do something differently. I, I know my brain's telling me, go eat, go eat, go eat. But what I really need to do is to go sleep. And I can sit and read People Magazine and not a lab journal. Uh, you know, I can read something junky. Or sometimes I'll just take time out, I'll pour myself some sparkling water at night because I don't eat at night. That also helps me from a habit behavior because I was always eating to soothe it, especially at night. And so I drink sparkling water, that's okay. I have some natural calm in it and I play a game called Pocket Frog, uh, which they are telling me is almost out of date, but it's like Angry Birds. <laughs> <laughs> so they're like, they have to update this and they're not going to, but it's like Angry Birds. So, so I'm doing something with my hands and, it, and, and I also meditate, I got the Headspace app and that helps to kind of take myself out. And when I close my eyes, I can see colors. I don't know if anyone else meditates, I see stuff. And it's very, it's so interesting, I wanna do it. Uh, because sometimes I'll see colors and patterns, sometimes photos. You never know what you're gonna get, you just let it flow. But by the time I'm done doing that, then the, that urge, that binge urge is kind of passed. As long as I haven't eaten off my food template, because if I have, I mean, just forget it, I stay out of the kitchen. I, it's like, it, I have a, a blog friend that comes along all the time, she has a private blog, but she says, oh, it's your neural pathways are there. It's that brain chemistry, and you're gonna have to keep in a habit and a routine to really help me. Of course, if something changes and I travel, I'm gonna be out of my routine, I might eat later in the day. But I tell myself, I'm only gonna eat what I brought. I'm not gonna eat the junk you're passing out on the plane. Even if I'm really hungry, I can wait. I often travel with an avocado in my bag, and I whip it out and eat it. You know, uh, it doesn't but, smell as uh, bad as a can of sardines. That's right, I've been told, no sardines on the plane. So I, 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 I know. I, 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 or I said, so what about oysters? I have a van. I, I a van pool every day. I go, hey guys, what do you think about oysters on a plane? No dice. <laughs> no, no, no. Sardines, you know, no, but oysters, no. So, uh, but I do try to to have replacement behaviors, 
and then little rewards like I can read the People magazine uh, if I want to relax uh, or might play with my cats. I might, if it's daylight, I might go outside. I might call a friend or I might read blog, other blogs or Twitter or what have you. And that'll, I'm a big reader, so I'll, that'll take my attention away. I'll, oh! And, and, um, and I kind of redirect my own behavior. But, uh, um, and, and sometimes, I mean, sometimes I've just had to remove myself from the person or the situation permanently or semi-permanently where I know I can feel I'm getting upset and I just need to go take a break. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, you have more tips? So I personally feel uh, she, she said something very nice that you know people would end up eating if they're stressed or if they don't sleep enough. Mm -hmm. So if you don't sleep enough and if you're stressed, you know, I have seen at least this behavior with my clients or me, they usually end up eating sugars. And once they start, they will continue this habit. They will not come back on track. At the same time, a person would, you, your, your question was how do you stay committed on the diet? And I personally feel that if, you know, I realize with me, if I do not work out, if I do not work out, I cannot stay on this diet. So I think it's correlated. If I stop my workouts, that could be thrice a week of weight training. If I stop that, you know, very soon I start eating wrongly. So I personally feel that some sort of physical activity or exercise or connecting yourself with nature, maybe just, just a walk, would help you even track your diet. That's, that's something which works for me. And if I don't eat correctly, then I do not go to the gym also. Like it's all interconnected. Mm, yes, this <laughs> yeah. is true. There's a pattern. I'm going to add some tips for you as well. So I'm trained as a, a psychologist as well as nutrition. And so it can be really empowering to understand where habits come from and you know cravings and, and appetite come from several things you know one is going to be you know um, hormonal um, you know lack of energy in our body but there's also the part of the brain that creates habits and that's dopamine driven and so um, a lot of people think of dopamine as like this reward chemical but it's actually just a learning chemical in the brain the whole reason that we get a dopamine hit for anything that we do in life is that our brain wants to train us to do things that keep us alive uh, and frankly we're all you know Rob Wolf is gonna be here later this this weekend and you know we're wired to eat we really are like um, that's the way our brain is designed is to eat as much as possible to move as little as possible and the dopamine hits that we get in life are all along those lines and so uh, the way that our brain re learns things is that whenever we do it so let's just you know it can be things about all kinds of things that are for our survival but we'll talk about food specifically is that um, anytime you eat and this could be anything in any specific specific situation your brain remembers the context that you got food and you know it's talked about as like well it's because your brain's trying to remember where in the wild that food was located and so let's say that um, every morning you get up and you always, you know, put creamer in your coffee, you know, the, the sugar creamer, um, the more time you get a dopamine hit in your brain and your brain goes, that was good, you should do that again. And so every time you get up in the morning, you're, you start craving uh, that creamer in your coffee and it's shown uh, that dopamine starts to release as soon as you get back in that same environment before you even get to consume that creamer. And so uh, one of the things you can do then, so it, the more times you've done that, the more years you've done that exact habit, the stronger that conditioning is in your brain and the more the cravings will be. And it doesn't have anything to do with, with actual hunger or physiological need for food and calories. It has to do with your brain's like, we've done this so many times, you should keep doing this so you stay alive and survive. And so you can use that actually to your advantage. The way that you can is you've got to notice um, notice the pattern. What is it that you do the same every time? And if you can do something different right before that pattern happens, that is where you have the control. Once you get in that environment, it's, it's often really, really challenging to get over it. So for example, let's say you, I'll just keep going with the example of you get up in the morning and you go make your coffee and then you put creamer in the coffee. I, I don't know if you do or not, but everybody can relate to that example. So what you can do instead to break that habit loop in your brain is that instead of going to make coffee first thing in the morning is that perhaps you go out and walk out and check the mail and then you do something different in your routine. Um, maybe you don't make coffee, you go and buy it somewhere instead or something like that. So you gotta break that habit before the first step of that 
um, habit happens. And then that's where you'll have, you're like, oh, I don't even want the coffee and the cream anymore. Um, and so finding ways and identifying those patterns, and a lot of times in life we've got a routine, like we do the same thing, and it might be just walking to your kitchen and you see the food out on the counter, or you always go to the cupboard and you grab these nuts or whatever it is. And so breaking that pattern, <coughs> in, and sometimes it's a bunch of those throughout the day that you've got to change. So changing your routine can be a really powerful way of, of overcoming that and changing, changing those habits. What other, other questions? Yeah, mm -hmm. excellent question. So how do you deal with friends and family that want you to go back to your high carb lifestyle? I think, I think that challenge is a bigger challenge than eating the way I eat is because uh, when you have friends uh, telling you that you, you're fat and it's not gonna change mm -hmm. and it's gonna take years, you might as well eat. Or someone's birthday and the friend's like, you know, show me the love by eating this cake. Mm -hmm or one beer is fine, for me, it's my birthday. I think these things are, the statement after that statement, you know, please have this cake. You've been on this life and just lost five kgs. You know, you rather enjoy your life. <laughs> you know, such statements are more difficult than to not have your carbohydrate picked. It's during such statements where a person's forcing or pressurizing or the fourth person's, you know, not acknowledging or not respecting, or as a matter of fact, going against, saying that you're not losing enough, or you know, you lost, and I don't think you'll reach there. I think that kind of makes sure. At least I used to fall off my, you know, routine or my regime of eating the way I eat right now. So that was more difficult than the diet, or the diet was not difficult. It was these things which, okay. which were more difficult. So I think some of the some of the same things, and you, you learn, uh, especially if you're doing it for health, and I'm doing it for an actual discount on my health insurance. And people say, "Oh, it's my birthday," or "I bought this at this special bakery, a special donut," and it's only once a year that we do this. So you can indulge once a year. But I know it's if it's something with frosting or really anything. I can't I can't do gluten. I'm just gluten intolerant, not celiac. But it's, it's going to make me really sick and give me possibly binge urges for a couple of weeks. That takes up a lot of brain space and other things I could be doing. So I just very nicely say it looks great, it smells wonderful. Um, I, I have to eat the food that I brought. And I always make a policy to only bring the, eat the food that I, I bring to work. For our family and friends, uh, the, almost all of them work with me, and especially at Thanksgiving. And they say, we're having a pot roast, there's gonna be potatoes, pick them out. Okay, that's fine, that'll work for me on that day. If I have high glucose that night, it's no big deal. Uh, other things, uh, people, I kind of train people, and the ones who didn't react well, some of them I'm not close friends with anymore, but most, like 99% of the people uh, stop food pushing. Uh, people will leave treats on my desk at work and at the cube farm, and uh, other people will come along and remove them because they know I, I don't even want to see it on there or I'll throw it away and they want to take it for themselves. So my cute mates know, my cute mates know to go ahead and remove her and tell the person dropping off, hey, don't do that. Uh, she doesn't eat that. And so I kind of train them. And so that's that's how they, and, and some reacted well and I just decided it wasn't me. It was it was how the them reacting to the food. Sometimes food is love, especially someone told me in a business meeting that their grandmother was going to cry and, and be very much harmed if I didn't have the baklava that they were passing out. And, uh, and it was in front of outside people. And it's like, what do we do? Every single person is eating it but me. And I said, oh, you know, the doctor says. Uh, the doctor says, I can't have this. I, I can't have it. I just don't want to get sick today. I want to continue on the meeting. <laughs> so, so that worked. And then the, I haven't been asked like that ever again. That was probably my toughest situation. Um, but people have gotten used to me, and then they start to ask me, oh, oh, you're eating a, 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 a nom nom paleo, you know, it's nom nom paleo, it's Mexican beef on a little bit of, of a salad base yesterday morning, but it was at 9 a.m. Oh, you're eating a salad at 9 a.m. Yes, I am. But, you know, I'm hungry. I've really, because my hormones, you know, it's a hormonal thing, 
uh, and I don't eat after about 12 or 1, I'm really hungry right now, and so chowing mm -hmm. down. But um, so socially, it can be it can be a little bit difficult to work with. But almost everyone will work with you, and if they don't, if they keep pressing and pressing and pressing, sometimes a tray is waved underneath my face. You can't have this, and then they'll turn <laughs> to the other person, and it's like whoa, mm -hmm. um, it's okay, I don't want that because I just don't want to have two weeks of, of misery. Mm -hmm. and, and that's okay, and I don't need to always explain that to people, mm -hmm. but I haven't given in yet, so. Well, so. sometimes uh, they want you to come over to their side because it's easier than them looking at their own habits and, and realizing that maybe they need to change as well. More so sure. yeah. Sure. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. Sure. yeah, There's yeah. a lot of psychology involved, yeah, yeah, so. Yeah. It's yeah. because they can't do it. They would want you to, from maybe subconsciously, they would may want you to also not do it. Yeah. And sometimes just a simple, no thank you. Yeah. Is so I, I come up with reasons. I am fasting, you know, I have some fatty liver issues. I just mm -hmm. make up stories. <laughs> <laughs> Nobody has once argued with a doctor says so with me. Oh. They have never once said that because I overwork in the medical field. Oh my gosh, you're, I'm telling you, I've, I didn't realize I was telling you to go against medical orders. That's right. <laughs> did my doctor, you know, tell me to lose weight? Yes, she did. Uh, did she tell me to manage my glucose? Yes, she did. So I don't need to explain the details. Right. Great question. What else? What other question? Yes. With human beings, and I'm, I'm not all, but a lot of us are, we almost reward ourselves by food. You mm -hmm. know, so you did a really good job at work and you go out and have an ice cream and all that. Two-fold question there. What did you find as you started this journey to be, did you find it setting more daily goals or weekly or monthly goals? And then when you met that goal, mm -hmm. how did you reward yourself? Because mm -hmm. obviously you can't really reward yourself on food, I'll yeah. say, but what did you reward yourself with that yeah. kept you, you know, motivated? Yeah, so the question is about, you know, as humans, we're accustomed to rewarding ourselves and other people with food. It's it's in the way that we talk about it actually. It's a treat, you know, this is my reward. And so how did you go about setting goals and when you accomplish things or maybe even just the desire to have some kind of a reward or treat? How did you how did you navigate that? So uh, yeah, that's true. Uh, now my personality is, you know, of an extreme nature, you know. For me rewards would never be a scoop of ice cream or would never be one piece of chocolate. I want to eat more. So I never gave up on these sweet cravings. For me, my rewards were always sweet. I always, you know, sweet, any dessert, anything sweet was something which I'd always want to eat. So I used to choose, instead of normal ice cream, I used to make my own ice cream. And mm -hmm. instead of having milk-based ice cream with sugar, I used to make cream-based ice creams myself and maybe add a scoop of zero carb whey inside, or probably a whole bar of lint chocolate inside, because I'm gonna have that much ice cream, <laughs> right? So uh, yes, it was, it used to be damaging, but that's still fine. If I wouldn't eat that, then maybe I would have gone and ate something worse in same quantity. <gasps> so for this is for me, like a lot of people say that I'm satisfied with a scoop of ice cream and two pieces of chocolate, and they don't need to worry about <laughs> Uh, they can also have uh, same option, like lint chocolate is a good option, dark chocolate, uh, on this diet to, to make sure that you, your cravings are met. Or maybe making your own scoop of ice cream just takes 10 minutes, I guess. And storing it in your freezer really helps. Or probably having some other deserts, which are in India, we make it, and it's very easy to make them. So I think, you know, rewarding myself was, it, ne it never happened that I did not reward myself. I already knew if I was craving something, I knew what I had to eat. You know, I, I was not, you know, starving. I was not, you know, pitying myself that, oh, you know, one day I'll eat a normal ice cream. But I never get, I never got there. It's because whatever I made was full of fat and I think fat makes a person feel nice. It was always tasty. It was not something which was not tasty. I ate it out of choice, not out of compulsion. So I, I rewarded myself a lot with, with junk food. So as you lose or get to a certain blood level <coughs> or whatever it is, um, uh, bring your own lunch for whatever your goal is, might be many different things. 
I, ne I promised myself I would never ever reward with food. So what that did was that helped me reward myself with other things. Like um, as I was going through my loss program, I each 10 pounds or each month or each month or depending on what the cutoff was, I'd pick a cutoff and then reward myself with some new um, cast iron skillet pan. So it was something related to food, but it was something I was gonna use time and time again. Um, it might have been a trip to the secondhand clothing store to, to restock my clothes. Um, I, am a, I love to do photography and traveling, and so it might be a camera lens. Yeah, uh, which builds on the exercise outside. You know, I tried to make it to where I was building on my new habits of moving more. Uh, one of my blog friends also said, hey, be careful about sedentary ha hobbies. If you have sitting hobbies where you're stitching, and I know outdoors, you can't go outdoors depending on where you live all the time. I'm lucky to live right here in San Diego County where we can go outdoors almost every day. Uh, but um, it, it should, so be sure your hobbies are more movement based. And so I would get the, I might get a new hiking pair of hiking boots. I might go hit the clearance rack at REI for a special water bottle or what have you, or just to look and to plan what my next reward was going to be. And so I do try to reward myself once a year or every other year. I kind of, I told everybody on my Facebook this morning, some, some people here are on Facebook with me personally. And uh, I told them, I said, you know, I'm treating myself for my five and a half years because I was previously 40, 40 years overweight or binge eating. And I said, I'm treating myself this year. I'm going to low carb USA. So I saved up my money and I bought my tickets last year for this year, knowing that I was guessing, knowing because I was going to do it no matter what. Thank you so much for being here and sharing your story. I know you're going to inspire a lot of people. It sounds like you've helped at least 500 people yourself, and I'm sure you've inspired a lot of people as well. Um, if people, we're going to put your contact info below in the show notes. Yep. Um, but just you know, quick, how do people get in contact with you if they want to Jeffy. follow you or? Uh, uh, you it's, it's Jeffy Booth. I think you can go on my uh, Facebook page. Okay. On my Instagram page. Uh, I will be providing you with my email address. Okay. You can put it down on the page. Perfect. We'll, we'll link that below. And how about for you? Do you have a public way that you want to connect with people? Or I do. I have a non-commercial blog, uh, weight maintenance blog, Garden Girl KP at Blogspot. Um, my Instagram, uh, especially for this conference, is Karen's pa at Karen's Paleo Life. If you want to see some of my California and travel photos, it's Garden Girl K uh, underscore KP. Everything's all linked up off my website. Uh, on the Garden Girl KP blog spot. Excellent. And I've just got one closing question for both of you. Uh, the meteors coming to Earth. This is our last day on the planet. What's your What's your last meal going to be? <laughs> <laughs> I think it'll be ice cream. Okay. <laughs> I hear a theme here. <laughs> You know, I I think I'd stick with the keto with the keto meal just in case the meteor missed. You know, I know how that's going to get me off. But but if I saw it coming in the sky, I I would have like a steak and kale and some blueberries. And if there were a box of Captain Crunch, on the side, <laughs> I would I would probably put it, put it on on a, a cake. I, I can I totally imagine, you know, she'd be outside a shop and looking at the <laughs> She'd like, go in, I'll go out. Yeah. So, so uh, you know, maybe maybe I'd have, a, or a caramel or something, maybe I'd have a hit of sugar right before the big one. But, <laughs> but you know, if, if I had some 85% chocolate there, I toured the Theo Chocolate Factory oh, recently okay. in Seattle, and I could even have the 70%, a small amount. If that 70% chocolate was sitting there, I'd grab that. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Well, that's great. Thank you for thank watching. You. Oh, one no, more thank thing. You. Okay. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, thank you for letting oh, us share. Yeah, thank you so much. much. If you guys like this video, give us a thumbs up. Everyone, thumbs up. Uh, and uh, subscribe if you'd like to see more. And um, stay tuned. We're going to have some more for you, too. So thanks for watching.